everyone and welcome back to another brand new episode of What the Throne, the weekly Collider Games podcast. My name's Destin. I'm here with Ashley Victoria Robinson. You're back. You were gone last to week. To the snow, <laughs> as yes. it turned out. Yes, but now I'm back. Yes, uh, I think me and Haley talked, uh, what did we talk We talked about uh, George R. R. Martin's uh, book ending. Yes. And how it is going to be different or not different. It's so from, funny. From people the, keep, the TV show. People keep asking me if I think it'll be more satisfying, which I think is a funny question because there's more context, so of course it'll be more satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we all sort of agree, broad strokes. It's going to yes. be the same. It's same person going to end up on the throne. Daenerys will still... Still burn King's Landing. Yes. I, but, but we just might have a better understanding of why. Yeah, a longer trek to, to get to that point because he's got the books. Yeah, how also, far into the first book are you? I am, I am <laughs> four hours into it. Out and, of 36? <laughs> yeah, 33, four hours. And like Tyrion has not even gotten to the wall yet. Okay. <laughs> Him and like Jon Snow are like fight, like arguing uh-huh. on the way there. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you need one good plane ride, and you'll get through that whole book. <laughs> yeah, it's just funny because it's like that in the show is like two, three minutes. Yeah, and then in this one, it's this long thing. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying. It. I'm liking it. Uh, like I said, I, I'm I'm glad I had saved mm. the books till then because now I get to relive the series in a different way Mm -hmm. and I still get I won't be surprised by the big things right like Mm -hmm. a red wedding or anything like that but I will still get surprised by different things you'll be surprised that how many characters have different names (laughs) different names and you know just different things like uh Jane Poole, who doesn't exist in the show. Yeah, yeah. She gets a lot of Sansa's. Um, mm-hmm. She is the OG wife of Ramsay Bolton. Sansa absorbs a lot of her storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, John uh, Rob's wife is completely different, has a completely different mm-hmm. name. Weird side characters like that where upon reflection, you're like, why did they change that? Yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about the, the Game of Thrones documentary, The Last Watch, two hours long, came on HBO. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about it. Talk about our thoughts, our review, what we liked, what we thought maybe they could have shown more of. And then let's talk about whether or not it um, should or will influence people's reactions mm-hmm. to Game of Thrones, especially the people who had negative reactions yeah. to it. Um, but let's just start off with the documentary itself. Uh, did you did you watch the whole thing in one sitting, or did you you piecemeal it? I did. I watched it all in one. Okay. Time. I watched it yesterday morning. <laughs> okay. I thought I was gonna piecemeal it. And I ended up just watching the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you enjoy it? I really loved it, and mm-hmm. I liked that it focused on people who did like oddly specific jobs. Mm-hmm. I think they probably went to set. And they're like, we're just going to shoot a bunch of stuff. And then these people are the ones who turned out to be the most interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, like the dude who is the extra oh, and yeah. who just loves Game being that Thrones. part. Like yes. I, he was great. You can tell that they didn't plan to talk to that dude. Um, and it's really cool that they organically let that become part of the storyline. But that documentary reminded me about what I loved about the Lord of the Rings documentaries mm-hmm. because in, they have documentaries on the lady who makes Arwen's costume and mm-hmm. she talks about the intricate um, uh, sewing that goes into the bodice that you see for like a half a scene. And I always think it's really cool to see those aspects behind the scenes, even if it's something that like the snow, the snow guy was like also one of my favorites. <laughs> um, and, and to appreciate how much work goes into something that you take so much for granted. So I really enjoyed it. You? Yeah, I did, but it was different than what I thought it was going to be. Uh, that extra's name, Andrew McClay. There you go. Uh, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, it was, I I did enjoy it. It was it was different than what I thought. It was interesting when you talk about the snow guy. Like, so I watched it thinking, okay, I'll watch half an hour, forty five minutes, yeah. and then the next day I'll watch another whatever. And I, I ended up watching the whole thing. Uh, my girlfriend, on the other hand, was kind of coming in and out of the mm-hmm. room, so she was only watching parts of it. And I was telling her she she's a fan of Game of Thrones, but not the way I am. Yeah. 
And I was trying to explain to her, like, that guy right there, his only job <laughs> is to, to, to make snow. Uh, Jason had watched it before I did. And when I started watching it, he came in and was like, have you got to the snow guy yet? So, like, I was anticipating his arrival. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Andrew McClay, I think he was, like, the standout, like, the, the kind of breakout star, if you will, totally. from this documentary. got to get him on the pod. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love the ending of where he ends up. And so that's really funny because I went to New Zealand a couple years ago um, on a job for a different website. And um, I met a guy there named Mike the Guide. Mm -hmm. Mike the Guide takes you on the Lord of the Rings tour. Yeah. Um, and he was an extra. He was like an Urukai, uh -huh. and he was an extra in a lot of the Lord of the Rings movies. So it reminded me of like this friend of mine in New Zealand. And I was like, I liked at the end of the movie, he kind of got this cool, like happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was sad because the thing that he loved doing the most in basically the world, right? Yeah. Was over and done, and he could never come back to that, mm -hmm. right? And then he gets to live on and doing the tours because he gets a one tell. And after this documentary comes out, dude, people are gonna be flooded. Oh, like, I uh, went and followed him on Twitter immediately. Yeah, yeah like where, he's like, low key famous now. Yeah, and, and like people <laughs> who go uh, to to Ireland will be mm -hmm. like, okay, I want to go on the tour, but I only want his and, yeah tour. his tour. And he looks like he loves talking about it. He gets mm -hmm. to talk about it. He relives those moments as he's giving the tour. It was cool when they interspersed scenes from the show where he was very prominently featured as well. And there was one moment, I think it was when they were um, like breaking into King's Landing and he was talking about like, we're the Starks and like we've been beaten down by the yeah. Lannisters and now we're going to get in. It's been seven seasons. And I was like, I love how much you're into that. You know, you want to think that everyone. Uh -huh. Is that enthused about their job? <laughs> not only that, look, he's not a real actor, right? He's never going to... He's not a classically trained actor. Yeah, he's not going to be like a lead actor in a big star mm -hmm. movie. But for an extra, that's what you want, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who, one, looks the part, is enthusiastic about the part, and two, is actually putting some thought and energy into those scenes. And mm -hmm. he was living out the like... When the guy with like the 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 Bolton jacket came yeah, that over. was so funny. <laughs> but also the correct response. <laughs> yes, and he was just like, you know, how dare you? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it, the funny thing too was when I started watching, I saw him. I was like, I recognize him. Me I too. Like, I was like, me too. He's one of the Stark guys. You know what I mean? Yep. And then they the showed beard him. is very prominent. Yes, the, <laughs> and I think of the way his like face is, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I've seen that guy. He he's one of the Stark. If he's uh, smart, he'll hop onto Krypton, which is shooting in that same area now. Uh, that's, that's funny. But I'm glad you br brought up the Lord of the Rings ones because that's actually my favorite behind-the-scenes stuff mm -hmm. for movies. Like, that's like I watch, you know, usually you watch a, a, a movie. I still buy Blu-rays. And you watch the behind-the-scenes stuff. It's something, like, terrible or very yeah. sparse, don't have anything. The Lord of the Rings ones are like very like they're long as long as a movie is. In the extended Return of the King extra features on the on the first disc of the extras, it opens with Billy Boyd talking to camera, and he's like, "There's four hours of extras. Go outside, mm -hmm. take a walk." Like there is so much, and those were the first DVD extras I'd ever watched. Mm -hmm. I thought they were all like that <laughs> and like that in depth. And like I was really young when they came out and like Lord of the Rings is the thing that made me like want to work in entertainment mm -hmm. and want to be creative and want to write and act and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, and then you go and watch everything else and you're like, oh, well, Star Trek has like a cute blooper reel. Yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of it. Like you're very lucky to get content that is that interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because that world is so rich that. The snow guy, or the I like the location scout too. Is she just yeah. swearing all the yeah. time? <laughs> um, that that can be that interesting because we love it as much as the people who work on it. Yes, yes. I mean, the Lord of the Rings ones, they're like three hours, four hours yeah. long, and I watched them all because mm -hmm. I felt like I was there on set with them. Work. I wasn't working, but you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, totally. Through through their eyes, and that's how the Game of Thrones kind of felt, even though it was only. Only two hours. Yeah, you know? only. <laughs> uh, but Which yeah. is more than most TV shows get. Yes. You know, most, you know, we talk, we're talking about Lord of the Rings. Those are movies. Those yes. are like million, billion dollar franchises. TV shows usually get even less than that. So yes. for Game of Thrones to get this is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, who, who else kind of stood out? I mean, the guy that played the Night King. 
Oh, he was fabulous. Um, his story was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really interesting then to watch him be like the person who goes down to the fans yes. and he's like really into it, but also kind of unsure of his place. Now he's like, am I an actor or am I a stunt man? Yeah. And maybe I'll go fall down some stairs after this. I don't know. He's the kind of dude I want to be friends with. Yeah. He apparently there was a different actor in the Night King role before, but well, he probably. left. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, they carry to him. I think Benny F. R. Weiss just called him and said, hey, do you want to be? The Night King. And he said he only heard them say king, and he said, yeah, I'll be whatever king you want. Yeah. But I thought his story was really incredible because he talked about um, his unique upbringing in Czechoslovakia when it was still Czechoslovakia before it became Czech Republic and mm -hmm. Slovakia. Um, and it was really amazing to hear how dance and choreography brought him out of that mm -hmm. um, and like made him a whole person and helped. Like That was a really beautiful story that you don't hear a lot in the western world it's just like i'm from oklahoma and i moved to la and which is like people from oklahoma are great but mm -hmm. <laughs> some of my best friends are from oklahoma um but i thought that was a really like surprisingly emotional story mm -hmm. and he wasn't like you and i have talked we don't really sort of care one way or the mm -hmm. other for the night king but it made me endeared to him yes you know even more you're like that's a cool dude i like that dude i'm trying to think of because there were so many little storylines um the i think she was a Maybe a, then effects lady when her and her husband yes, were there they, and they couldn't be with their when she broke down and she was like crying yeah. because she'd been away from her daughter for three weeks. I was like, I really hope that the people who are feeling personally offended yeah. um, see this, because if you think that anyone went into this to try and offend you or yes. to try to upset you or, or from a place of disrespect, that's just not true. No, or the lazy aspect. That Exa the people exactly. Come throwing yeah, out, like, yeah, yeah. They were just chilling, hanging. Yeah. They're like, fuck it, it's the last season. We don't so really evidently care. evidently not the case. No, we'll get into that a little bit more. But yeah, it, it was nice to see that. And then he, having her daughter show up. And be in the final be, shot. Yeah, be in the final scene mm -hmm. as an extra. And I think it, she, she was like a effects person, and then her husband was an effects But I think, was her husband like... Um, like makeup and effects and was she like visual effects or something like that? Something like that. And they pitched Yeah. Late like the show was on when they were they came in, I think, a couple seasons later. Mm -hmm. They didn't start with the show. I also thought uh, David Netter's assistant was very funny. Yeah. Um, I'm currently married to mm -hmm. a showrunner's assistant. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like that personally like really hit home. And when he they were they were talking to him about the specific type of paper yes. and how it has to be U.S. letter paper and it Not has to A4. be yeah and it has to be goldenrod and they shipped all this paper over and he was they were like well why is that the case like just don't question yeah, yeah, yeah. the process <laughs> I thought that was like a very funny like it was such a true response like you could tell how like tired and fresh he was like just don't worry about yeah, it yeah. and he was like this copy like, is my like, nemesis yeah. <laughs> like it's more trouble to like try and think or argue or like. Then just do exactly, yeah. Do it and make the director happy. And any of us who have had bosses who are very successful at what they do, and we've had to facilitate their eccentricities, I think that moment really hit home. Uh, I thought it was like one of the realest moments of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, for people who don't know, David Nutter is a, a very famous television director, and he's, specifically for pilots. Yes, pilot, they arrow call him pilot. The, they call him the pilot whisperer, mm -hmm. and he just like they hire him to do pilots. I think he's done something like. 14 pilots and 13 of them have gone to series, yeah. which is like unheard of. Yeah. And then he didn't do the pilot for Game of Thrones, though. No, but he did the think... Red Wedding. Yes. He did a lot of the most iconic. And I think he did an episode in six, seven, and eight. He's one of their most recurring directors. Yeah, you have Miguel Sapachnik, which we got mm -hmm. to see. You know, you know, another thing that was nice to see is someone who you know, is aspiring to be a writer and director, mm -hmm. seeing someone like Miguel Spachnik, who's, you know, gotten so much critical acclaim for Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he did one of my favorite episodes, Battle of the Bastards. Mm -hmm. And, like, just seeing him, like, on set and going, man, like, <laughs> being so stressed, even though I know I, I felt bad for him, but, like, at least seeing that, hey, this guy who does all these wonderful things that people love and... That even he's like stressed out and mm -hmm. like you know what I mean mm -hmm. like it's not an easy thing 
to do, even when you have the credibility, the experience, mm-hmm. the, the resources. Yeah, the resources. Like all those things are in his corner, but still, he's like still nervous about. And it it kind of circles back to a discussion that we had on a previous episode of like, with all jobs, there is that point where it does become a job and Mm -hmm. you are doing the nuts and bolts of it and just trying to make sure that it all comes together Mm -hmm. and it's all okay in the end. I know the main actors weren't featured in this a lot, but we did see um, a few of them for a little while. And I thought it was very interesting when they were filming the lighting of the pyres Mm -hmm. um, because Sophie Turner has to get quite emotional as Sansa Mm -hmm. lights Theon's pyres and you can see her under an umbrella getting her last looks done before the next day. And she's still crying. Like she's yeah. maintaining that emotional state. Um, and as an actor, I, I know how hard that is. And that was just a moment for me, even though it wasn't a main narrative mm-hmm. um, that really stood out. And then watching the table read was also like yes. kind of wild. Um, obviously the Kit Harrington crying thing has gone viral, yes. but I was like more taken aback by, um, what, yeah, his reaction and how Gwendolyn Christie was trying to be like, it's okay, yeah, yeah. you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and how upset he obviously was by the way he went out. It was yeah. kind of sad. Yeah, because I mean, he's been this. I mean, Varys has been around since season one, mm-hmm. and he's a character that many thought would survive to the end. I thought, I thought so. I, yeah. yeah, and he was a puppet master behind a lot of stuff, and so I think he probably thought he was going to last until the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was probably more upset. I don't know, less about like less screen time and more about like, oh man, my character should have made it all the way to the end. You know? Oh, I mean, you can be personally affected too. Like you play a character, you get attached to yes. them. Maybe he didn't like the way, you know, there's any number of reasons and he handled it very professionally. He didn't throw fit. He didn't say anything about it. He obviously he said the lines, he did his job. He's, he's fabulous, but it was interesting to just see. I guess the rawness of the documentary is like maybe what spoke to me the most because Game of Thrones is a very polished yes. show um, on every from per, you know from performance to writing to the color correction mm-hmm. at the end. So to see everyone be sort of raw and unfinished in that way was really fascinating. I I started like tripping out when it was just the first shot of them kind of waiting to go into the room and it's just like yeah oh there's you know uh john snow and there's torment looks Star. exactly the same yeah Tormund, <laughs> and they're just like hanging out yeah. like some of their smoking cigarettes yeah. and they're just chilling like all right they're gonna let us in anytime now you know it's what i mean wild to see the guy who plays the hound yeah. Just as a man. Yeah. Because um, I've so rarely seen him without the big uh, prosthetic on. And there's a bit later on um, with a man who plays the Night King and he's choreographing the Clegane Bowl and they're just in their sweats. And it's it's him and it's that big bodybuilder mm-hmm. who's the mountain. And they're like smiling as they're going through the motions with their wooden sticks. But yeah, it's kind of weird to see them uh, as normal. It's like seeing a teacher, right? When you see your teacher at the grocery store, you're like, don't they unplug you at the end of the night? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, that table read was very interesting. I, I think my thing was, I thought we were going to go through the journey with the writers and producers Mm -hmm. in there. Cause I've watched, uh, like Lost has some decent uh, behind the scenes stuff and you'll see how they are. And I'm sure Game of Thrones does that, did that and probably even more so where, there had multiple locations shooting at the same time. I think Game of Thrones definitely did that. Did, but I think less so in this this yeah. season. Yeah, well, because they, they finally they, had everyone yes. together. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember with like Lost, it's like so you're following like the producer writers here, like back in LA writing the episodes, and you have the producers and right like on set shooting one episode at this location, another like over here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they're shooting like. An ep- episode five here, four here, three mm-hmm. here, and they're writing six and seven. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Lord of the Rings also very like that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought it was going to be, I think, more like that, but it ended up being more like, oh no, no, these are like the people, like it's almost a human interest piece yes. in a way. Yes, and, and, and to see like everyone's struggles and their passion about mm-hmm. their job and, and the show, and like, okay, like even. The guy that makes snow, he still wants to make the snow as best possible. Oh my gosh. I loved him when 
you it's sort of like hard cuts to him and they're scooping the snow and he was like they told me I needed to have snow here but now I have to take it over there we're gonna put it all back in and that's like a whole half day like and he, he, he that's the facts of what he's going through but he very much has that attitude of like well man like I'm not laying bricks this is great <laughs> I loved him so much well and then they flew him all the way to Spain to do the last yeah. scene he's like he, I've he, never been to King's Landing yeah because before. there's never had snow they mm-hmm. never had any need I also like the fact that they flew in all these people that had nothing to do. Oh, like the Wave and the wave, Jack, Jack in, in Jon Snow Euron, was there. I know it was one of the guys, the Night King. Yeah, they Just brought, to sort of throw them off. Yeah, because so that people would say, oh, what's going on here? I did think it was funny when they were... Um, they were talking to Kit Harrington, who's kind of the main actor who's featured the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was saying that all the Spanish fans call him Keat yeah. because of his accent. And then when he raps... Um, like 30 minutes later in the document, all the extras are like, Keat, Keat. Yes. So it was kind of funny to see that joke come full circle yeah. in the narrative of the documentary. He was rocking the, the extra jacket that... Uh, that was really sweet. That uh, Andrew McClay gave him. Yeah, and he there was also that bit where uh, Andrew was like, I gave Kit this jacket, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he's been trying to give me money and I won't take his yeah, money. Yeah. And I was like, take Kit Arrington's money. He's rich. <laughs> <laughs> you are making a respectable day rate. Take his money. <laughs> but it was very sweet. Yes, yes. And it's cool how they had like different jackets for different seasons. Yeah. And depending on which house you were under and what you did there. I bet a, a very sneaky person could find this on eBay if they wanted yeah, to. <laughs> I'm sure. And I'm sure a lot of people will be paying good good amount of money, mm-hmm. money from it, especially after the documentary. Oh, for sure. Now that we all know about them? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Bernie Caulfield, the mm-hmm. executive producer. One, I didn't know it was a woman just because of the name Bernie. Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't either. And then I saw her, and then she was like, I don't know. She she just like had this room with like all this stuff there. She had all, it was so funny. She had like all the memes that like we would print out and put in our work space. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like the script and the shooting time and it's like the glass slipper. And I thought that was very funny. I thought she was like who you want to be your cool aunt. Uh-huh. Um, like I thought she was super cool and she really came across as like a nice normal person and sometimes mm-hmm. executives come across as crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was fascinating because we didn't spend a lot of time with her but we sort of checked in with her at different points mm-hmm. throughout the day. And you could sort of see her getting more tired but at the same time more relieved and i thought it was interesting that they chose to not humanize her it's not like we thought she was a monster or anything but um yeah just like see her in that light well also seeing that she cares she's not sitting Mm -hmm. there going oh how much money do we make today yeah 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 yeah, yeah. or they weren't talking about like how many views and we all know that the views were like no matter what anyone said like through the roof on this season so and also just like uh, the big stuff that people just don't get. I and mean, look, you and me work in the industry and mm-hmm. we're around it and we know stuff more than the average person. But even like something like this where we knew that they're working hard, obviously a lot of money. Look, I didn't know they were going to take seven months to build King's Landing. The, well, because you can't blow up, you can't burn down Croatia, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, even the discussion that they sort of open her her segment with where they're talking about the direwolves, how big are the direwolves, how fast do the direwolves run? And mm-hmm. then they have that graphic of like the scale where they've clearly been growing up the direwolves over the seasons. And I was like, huh, I would have never considered. But if you are animating that sequence and Ghost is a part of it, yeah, mm-hmm. it can Ghost run faster than a horse? And then I spent a lot of time thinking about dire wolves. <laughs> Not invented by Game of Thrones, even though a lot of people think they were. Um, the other person, b- bigger star that we got to see a lot of was uh, Amelia Clark. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Especially in the dressing room to put on her wig. I want to know what she was. This is so weird. I want to know what she was eating because we saw her the first time get the wig on. And then we saw her with Kit Harrington in Iceland getting the wig on again for her final scene. Mm. Um, and she was like eating out of a mason jar mm. both times. And I was like, what are you eating? <laughs> what is in there? I was like trying to part because I saw it first and I, she had like a mitten on. So it looked mm. like a cup of noodles to uh-huh. me. <laughs> but I was like, there's no way that that's what she's eating. Um, and I also thought it was fascinating that she's she's sort of dyed her hair now, and we know she didn't. Then they they mentioned that before, but it was still important to her to put the wig on. And she talks about the transformation and how that mm-hmm. helps her ba- bring Danny to the forefront. And then I didn't realize um, maybe they cut it down, 
how much lace there was on that. Like the lace goes like all the way down to her mm-hmm. forehead. I assume they probably trimmed it up closer to her hairline because that might have been one of the first times she's putting on that wig. But I was like, wow, that's wild how far down that lace comes. And it looked good. And I didn't realize, too, that um, we see a little later on that Sons is wearing a wig. I really mm-hmm. thought that that was Sophie Turner's hair because mm-hmm. she's got red hair. But I guess not. Yeah. yeah. And, and the guys just like had their regular hair and they just... Yeah. Do stuff to yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, isn't that oh, isn't that always the way? <laughs> yeah. Well, except for Varys, who gets his hair taken out yeah. uh, with a with a wig. But uh, except on Lord of the Rings, Orlando Bloom is surely wearing a wig for that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, there was the food food truck or Lady, whatever. Yeah. And like her job serving everyone mm-hmm. and. Sir, like you know, running out of food and running out of uh, popsicles, and then they brought her around too. Yeah. It wasn't like okay, you're for you're the like the the food set lady only for, in Ireland, yeah. yeah. And they brought her to every place. I wonder if that was specially done for the final season, like they were trying to keep as many people together as possible because it does seem like a ridiculous expense. Mm-hmm. I'm like, there's no food trucks in Spain. Yeah, exactly. Or they're just so used to like what they get from her. Yeah. yeah she like yeah. made like some special sandwich that mm-hmm. like kind of came got created while they were doing Game of Thrones. If she's smart, her and Andrew uh Andrew got a spot on his tour where they stop by wherever she's parked for the day. <laughs> yeah. Um who else was kind of featured in that? Um the executive producer, the location snow guy. You don't see extra. a lot. You see a lot of the producers kind of at the beginning and the end. Yeah. Um, the, 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 those makeup and effects people. Yes, you see them a little bit throughout. I mean, Andrew's sort of your main. And yeah. his buddies kind of show up hither and thither. Yes. I love yeah. all the cuts of people reading at various points because um, if people don't know, usually on set you can't have your phone. Yeah. Who you can't have your phone past a certain point. Um, so it was just really funny to see. Like, we even saw Isaac Hampstead White at one point was like reading a magazine um, or to see the extras like with their feet up and they're reading like whatever book. That was very charming. Yeah. Or like characters like, you know, Night King and uh, Brand just yeah. like sitting next to each other, like yeah. chilling. And they were like, wow, they called you early. And it's like, well, television, uh, which is very true. Oh, yeah. It's like, get here, get ready sit for two and a half hours uh, the, the, yeah the hurry up and wait yeah which is yeah the location it's scout a, location manager she would there was a sequence where they were like building the extras holding mm-hmm. and they were in a field but there was like a propane tank here so they couldn't smoke over here and there was an electric fence here so they couldn't go over here and there was a drainage ditch here so they couldn't go over here and if anyone's ever done extra work or been on set with extras and that number of, like, extras just wander off because, again, it's a lot of waiting. Yes. Uh, and then even on set as an extra, it's, it's a lot of or a background. It's a lot of waiting. So that was funny that they were concerned about, like, how they were going to corral everyone in the four hours that they would be sitting before they wound up, you know, being used on set. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, the whole building that uh, King's Landing set, oh, seven months. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and then I, that giant Ferris wheel just crops up in the background. That is so, <laughs> that, it's so funny because that is also another thing. When I was talking about uh, like uh, Miguel Sapochnik, it's like that's such something happens on like an indie production or even just a small like uh-huh. shoot b- with you and your friends, and here it happens with the yeah. biggest television show on the planet. And it's funny because the lady who runs the food truck, I think it's Lee, might be her name, um, brings it up. Where she's like, there was so much planning. Like, we talked to the city. We did this and this and this and this. And then this Ferris wheel yeah, shows up. Yeah, that is, yeah. And then it becomes someone's job to cut that out of the back of all of those scenes. And I'm sure somebody up in the Ferris wheel saw something that they weren't yeah. supposed to see. Yeah. But yeah. it turned out okay. Murphy's Law. Murphy's Truly. Law. Truly. All, all of Which is uh, absolutely true on a film set. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's talk about, like, the, the reaction. I mean, most people are, are pretty been pretty positive about the documentary i haven't seen anything negative about the documentary specifically have you no not really uh it may have tempered some of people's Mm -hmm. reactions i I don't think like i'm not saying if you watch this documentary one you should change your mind about how you felt in terms of the execution Mm -hmm. of the last season whether you liked it hated it had issues or, or whatever but I think it should change your viewpoint if you are one of those people that are like, 
Oh, they should feeling re- personally attacked. One that, or <laughs> they should reshoot it. Yeah. Like, did you just not see mm-hmm. what these people went through? And I know some people are like, "Well, we're just sending a message. We don't really want the reshoots." It's like, yeah, maybe some of you, but some of them legitimately want a reshoot done. Let's be honest, though. Um, I'll call you guys right out. That's not a message worth sending. That's no. It's rude. It's disrespectful. We all have things we don't like. Yes. Um, you either wait it out and they remake it, or you don't engage with it. Or, or if you want to criticize it on your own, uh, on your own show, on, on your, your own social tweet. media, yeah, exactly. on your own blog, exactly. whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but th- that's a level of disrespect that I I can't I can't abide. Mm-hmm. You know, there's lots of movies I see that I don't like. I don't write petitions. You know, I don't tweet at people and yeah. say that. It's just. It's disrespectful of people's hard work, and it's a lot of people's hard work, and it's more than just the actors, and it's more than just yeah. the directors, and that's one of the great things that this documentary shows. It shows all the people working 18-hour days, yeah. day in, day out, over Easter, and, and all these you know all these times that normal people would have off um, you know, to get this done, and they're doing their very best. No one sets out to make anything bad. No. Bad stuff just sometimes happens, and sometimes stuff happens that's not to your taste. And then also just the whole, you know, uh, kind of illusion that some fans think like I care about it more than they do. It's like really because this guy is like <laughs> has pictures of how the snow should look. You I know love what I mean? the snow guy, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like yes. the attention to that type of detail. Yeah. So obviously he's putting a lot more skin in the game right. than you are. Right. When you go work fifty five days of night shoots, then maybe you care. Yeah. As much, you know, and I understand that. I understand as a fan that it means something different to you than it does when it's your job. Yeah. Like those are two totally different things. You operate in different realms. Um, but to assume that people went in there and and were were lazy about it, yeah. I don't think this is the show to la- to put that criticism on. No. If you want to say rushed, I, I'd, I'd actually agree with I think people. We, I think we've said that a lot. We, yeah. It's been rushed, and we've talked about pacing being yes. a, a big result of that. Yeah. But no one was sitting on their butt. You right. Know what I mean? Yeah. Again, count no. one million, two million. Yeah. Million. <laughs> or like, eh, just yeah, just go ahead and shoot that over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, you can, there's no snow over there. Don't worry about it. Like, yeah. you know, they talked about locking off the camera at a certain point because you couldn't show it because it wasn't dressed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a Ferris wheel over there. Uh, yeah. Sure. It's fine. And yeah. I, I think also people, some people don't understand. Like, think about how much time it takes to shoot a movie edit a movie, do all the visual mm-hmm. effects for a movie, which most movies are two hours long. Yeah. Game of Thrones, even in this shortened season, was how many hours? Because then count those extended episodes. Yeah, so it was yeah, six yeah. episodes, but it was not six hours. It ended up being... It was like nine or ten hours. Yeah, it was getting you know up there, right? Mm-hmm. So imagine that. Yeah. Doing that and doing all of the editing, the visual effects. And I know people were complaining that they saw a cup or whatever, which, by the way, they... They just digitally remove it later. Anyways. I also think, I just think that's hilarious to me. Like that's also people looking for looking for anachronisms. I didn't notice the cup or the water bottle the I first time. I, I did not either because I was watching the show and I was engaged with the show. Like to me, that's people looking for fault. Yes. Or but someone I mean, but, but whose job it is to go and make an article about yeah, something. Yeah, and they like just that. use it like, oh my yeah. god, they don't care. They don't care anymore. That's just not true. Yeah, God forbid someone made a mistake. Yes. I mean, those things, you know, people have to understand, too. It's like they're they're watching it. They're they're going over things. Sometimes you mm-hmm. go you go blind when you, mm-hmm. you watch something over and over and over and over again. And you just have... Yeah, if you've never edited anything, let me tell you, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Be nice to editors. <laughs> yeah, because by the end of it, you don't know what the hell, like, in it's terms like, of... It's like rereading something you've written. You're yeah. like, I don't know if this is misspelled. What are words? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you don't, you know, I, I've like shot and edited stuff where I'm like, by the time, how many hours you put into it, and by the end you're like, is this good? I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know anymore because I've seen it so many times yeah. in so many variations. I don't know. There's so. a there's a meme about the creative process that I think is very accurate. And it was like, this is great. Let's do it. We're doing it. It's done. This is shit. I am shit. <laughs> Let's do it again. And I yes. think that's the most accurate description. And it's because the more time you spend with it, the more you're like, was this ever good? Yeah. Am I the worst? Who knows? And when you're working on something, I mean, they worked on this thing for like 
years, yeah. a decade, yeah. a decade plus. I'm sure you get a little hazy by the end of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the thing is like when I think, is it a part in, in the documentary with Amelia where she's like, she's like happy but sad? Yeah, she's like, I'm happy I don't have to stress out about this all the time, but I'm sad that I don't get to come and play in this world and be this person yes. anymore. Yes, yes. It was, it's, it's true. It's a... If you're doing something that long, put mm-hmm. that many hours into, you eventually you want a break. You want to go do something else. And I think I yeah. think a lot of people are upset with like Benioff and Weiss doing, you know, doing Star Wars because mm-hmm. they're saying, oh, they rushed this because they want to do Star Wars. I don't know what whatever the case may be, but you know, it's not like they like did it for a season or two and took off. It's, it's yeah, it's a long. Right, yeah. Time. Yeah, it's not like... This is actually... The show is very unique in that it has the same showrunner the yeah. whole way through. If you look at something like Flash, Flash has had f- three or four or five mm. showrunners by this point. Um, you know, that's also something that's very common that happens. So, like, it's very unique that they stuck with it as long as they did. And mm-hmm. they did for a reason. And we've we've also talked it to death, the reason why there's not more of it. And yeah. it's ultimately... It's not just their decisions. Yeah. So. Yeah, and yeah, like I said, you can criticize it. That's uh, you know, I think that's fair game sure. to criticize what you don't like and whatnot. But to to kind of, I don't know, attack people, attack people. I mean, you remember, and there's like, I invested so much time. It's like you invested so right, much time, girl. Please, you, you watched <laughs> yeah. whatever every yeah. every year. You put it about ten hours into it. Yeah. They just put like how many thousands of hours into um, you know? Yeah, I mean? how many years of their lives? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I just don't think that's you know, a good argument. Cause fans, we don't own the things we're fans of. Yeah. We feel very possessive of them. They become parts of our identity. You don't own them. Yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. And you just have to understand that, and you have to understand how to live in that world. Because yeah. George R. R. Martin owns them. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, the whole thing of, like, there was an argument that kind of broke out after the last podcast we did mm-hmm. about like we said, look, we're we didn't we're not paying for the production, and some people are like, yes, we did because we pay for the no, HBO. Girl, it's like no, no, that's that's not how it works. <laughs> no. That's not how it works. No, unless you are unless you are HBO, yeah, it's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> they are putting up the the money. For yeah, it. yeah. And again, if you wanted to make a real statement about it, you would have not engaged with it. Yeah. Like that's. You would have not paid for HBO if you th- yeah. if you think you're if you think you're what is it fourteen ninety nine a month for HBO yeah if you think that that your fourteen ninety nine is what pays for Game of Thrones that's really cute um, but also if you think it's that important then you shouldn't have given it to them yeah or you like like I or t- I, I keep shouldn't have tweeted about it you shouldn't have, you know. should have canceled before the finale absolutely that's yes. the, the, you want the real <laughs> statement yeah. cancel your HBO subscription right before the finale mm-hmm. that would have if you want to send a real message not this stupid petition BS or yeah, whatever, yeah. that's the real message because that's what they'll look at. They'll look at, oh, mm-hmm. this is, people don't like this and they canceled and they're showing this by not giving us money. Because entertainment is, it's a business at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and it's run by, it's run by bean counters. Uh, and we're lucky that we get something as good as Game of Thrones mm-hmm. as a result of it. But yeah, like that's how you make a statement. Don't buy the next two books. Don't buy the merchandise. Yeah. You're not willing to do that? Okay. Yeah. That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> that just means you, you... I'm sure you watched the documentary. It was the most watched thing on HBO this week. Yes. Um, also, it's great. It, it's really great. It's, I think, well, not what a lot of people expected, yeah. but I think it's tremendous. Yeah. I'm wondering if there will be any... One, will this documentary appear on the final oh, season for Blu-ray? Sure. And what additional supplemental stuff they will put on there. I think that's where you're going to get more things like we're used to seeing in the featurettes, like features with the actors yes. and the directors and the producers, because that's all stuff that uh, typically appears on the Game of Thrones sets. I think this was just a special thing. Yeah. So, I you know, it's one of those things. Honestly, I could watch like a whole series of them following... Each of those people could have had a documentary. I would have watched it. Like during the whole like <laughs> season, which yeah. you know took you know a long time to shoot. Yeah, yeah, and most TV shows shoot 
in uh, it's about a week an episode or eight days an episode uh, game of thrones shot a lot more than that yeah <laughs> well when you're doing 55 night shoots can you imagine no. shooting for 55 nights well also think about your sleep schedule in a at that row. point you'd be destroyed like because you're you're you have to get up at eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah well i mean you would get up so late in the afternoon and then try and go about your day well actually no you'd probably get up Closer. Probably get up at 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe a little bit before. When does the sun go down? It's around 7 or 8. Okay, so you get up at, what, 6 maybe? 5 or 6. Roll, roll the set, shoot until 6 a.m. Yeah. Sleep all day, buy some blackout curtains. Yeah. Like, it, but doing that 50, I mean, I've done that for a few days. It's hard. Right? It's hard. Uh, I did uh, my first job when I came out here. uh when I first started, I had a regular shift, m- Monday through Friday. Yeah. I ended up taking a – I took it because it was f- still full-time, but it was four days out of the week, but at 10 hours versus eight. Woof, yeah. And it was at night. It yeah. was like you show up and you start work at like 9 p.m., 10 p.m., yeah. and then work until like 8, 8 a.m. Oh, and then man. You, But it like bought me an extra day of the weekend. Freedom, yeah. But my schedule was so messed up. Like I was – that's was. I was well, how do you go to the post office? You huh? know, how do you go to the post office? How do you go grocery shopping? Um, we, weekends <laughs> or well, that, that extra day you get that one yeah, extra day. Yeah, yeah. You do you do all your errands on that one extra day? Yeah, that you get off. So, yeah. Uh, um, anything else you want to talk about from the documentary or related subject matters? Take Andrew's tour. Tweet yeah. at him and tell him to be on the podcast. Yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> I definitely. I've, I've, I haven't been to Ireland before, but I have. I haven't either, but I have soft plans to go in the fall. But so. I've been to Dubrovnik before, and I've walked the, the oh, thing. Yeah? You know the kind of the the Main, walled yeah. town, and I've seen some of those spots before. But you know, what's I, the capital of Croatia? Zagreb. I've been there. Oh, okay. I haven't, I haven't been there. I just my, only been to Dubrovnik. I went through on a train. My father, when I was a little baby child, was a peacekeeper in Croatia. So oh. it is wild to me that you can like go as a tourist and that it's like a same place. <laughs> and they film TV shows there. Uh, and that's great because that happened in like, they went from like a war zone to that in like less than a decade, which is incredible. Um, but it's always a trip for me to think that they make TV shows there now. Yeah. Because I remember getting like the UN airmail letters from him. Yeah. That's a... Uh... Interesting place yeah. that we went to. Yeah, our tour guide was explaining the history of mm-hmm. of Croatia and whatnot. And I was like, "Well, this place is beautiful. Like you, you wouldn't have thought." Okay, so, all this strife. Yeah. Well, you got to go to Iceland next. That's the that's where the waterfall is. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll, I'll I think I'll stick with Ireland instead. <laughs> I think Ireland uh, will be before Iceland. Yeah. Iceland. I mean, I haven't been to Iceland, but I've been to Alaska, mm-hmm. which is very beautiful as well. But you know, it's cold. Yeah, it's stark too. Yeah, like it's like my homeland, <laughs> <laughs> appropriately. Yeah. Um, all right, I think that's it for this episode yeah. of What the Throne. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Ashley, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V Robinson. The V is very important, and also check out my podcast Geek History Lesson at geekhistorylesson.com. And of course, I'm here every week except when I'm not talking Game <laughs> of Thrones. <laughs> And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, or subscribe to our podcast on the Collider Factory feed. So until next week, we'll see you guys later.